Imagine making so much money that you'd rather keep a ticket worth over $10 million as a souvenir than cash it in. Well, that's exactly what Bill Benter did in 2001. If you aren't familiar with sports gambling, you probably never heard of Bill Benter. In those circles, he is a legend. Some describe him as the most successful sports better of all time, making close to $1 billion betting on horses. Others call him an unparalleled mathematical genius. While he might be a genius, the methods he used to make all this money, betting on horses during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, isn't as complicated as you'd expect. In this video, I do my best to break down how he was able to create such an incredible edge and accumulate his vast wealth. At the end, I'll analyze if something like this is replicable today. First, it's important to understand just a little bit of history about Benter. He was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and had always been fairly mathematically inclined. While studying physics at college, he read the book Beat the Dealer, which used recently acquired compute power to create a system that creates a mathematical edge over the house in a game of blackjack. After that, he was hooked. There are conflicting reports on if he actually even graduated college before he packed up his stuff and moved to Vegas to count cards full time. While there, Benter was working odd jobs during the day and counting cards at night. He was only making very small profits until he ran into Alan Woods, who convinced him to join his card counting team. You can make a lot more money counting cards as a group rather than an individual. I believe this is where Benter ingrained one of the most important lessons about gambling that later led to a lot of his horse racing success. What he picked up here was a powerful understanding of the law of large numbers. What does this mean exactly? It means that if you have a very slight advantage, this perpetuates over time. That makes small edge games like blackjack and horse racing very difficult if you don't have a decent bankroll. Let's look at an example from a lecture Benter gave in 2004. These are the expected outcomes for a very small edge, say 1%. Over maybe 100 trials, these are all the possible outcomes. As you can see, one standard deviation and two standard deviations out are very clearly losing money. Now let's look at a different time frame, say over 1,000 trials. With this much time, the slight edge creates winning scenarios almost three quarters of the time. And finally, let's look at 100,000 trials. In this case, essentially all the scenarios you have positive expected value outcomes. The biggest difficulties come from having enough bankroll to get past the worst case scenarios and also keeping a consistent edge with the models that you use. That's more important than horse racing than in blackjack. In a game like blackjack, you have a pretty consistent edge as long as the rules of the game don't change. Unfortunately, it looks like Benter's edge was just a little too great because him and Alan Woods found themselves banned from essentially all of the casinos in Vegas. The two of them thought they might be able to create a similar edge in horse racing to what they had in blackjack. At the time, Hong Kong was the horse racing mecca, so they packed their bags and relocated again. So the team saved up around $150,000, mostly Woods money, that they were going to use to stake their operation. They had to be very efficient with this because it'd be used both for testing the model as well as a reserve for the worst case scenario that I described with the law of large numbers. This brings us to the second factor that I believe led to much of Venter's success. It may sound boring, but bankroll management is what allows them to make the most of their initial investment. Venter is a known fan of the Kelly Criterion, which is now a mainstream concept. That allows you to determine the optimal theoretical size of each bet that you place based on the bankroll and your expected probability of winning. This is optimized for maximizing your total long-term growth of your money or your bankroll. The math for deriving this formula is quite complicated. However, the formula itself is fairly simple. In this case, we're trying to solve for F, which is the percent of our bankroll we should use in each bet. We take the probability of winning minus the probability of losing divided by the payout. Let's do a quick example. If you think your odds of winning a game of blackjack hand is 52% and the payout for our hand is equal to whatever we wager, then the equation would look like this. If our payout was actually greater, say we somehow got paid double whatever we placed, the equation would look like this. This idea of proper bankroll management was integrally important for Benter and Woods, especially since they reportedly lost $120,000 in their first year testing the model. The team, because of this, ended up actually having some money disputes, and they ended up going their separate ways. Venter was out of money, but at the end of this period, he did have a working model. Reports suggest that he went to Atlantic City and started his own blackjack team to create a new bankroll for himself before he returned to Hong Kong in 1988. From there, his model started to win. The first year back in Hong Kong, he made around $600,000, and it only went up from there. Now let's talk about how this model actually worked. I know that's what you're all here for. Remember how I said his model really isn't that complicated? By today's standards, that's 100% correct. Venter's goal is to get an expected win probability for each horse during the race. In each race, if you add up the expected probability for the horse to win the race, they should all sum to one. It appears that the model he used at the time was basically a multinomial logistic regression. Again, this might sound complicated, but this is a very basic approach by today's standards. What separated Benter from the pack was the quality and the richness of the data that he used. There was a huge amount of effort needed to collect much of the data that he had. If he was one of the very few people to have access to this information, he could create a very distinct advantage. According to the report he wrote, these are some of the factors he considered initially. First, he'd look at the current condition of the horse. Next, he would look at 
variables that evaluated past performance of the horse. He would also try to adjust the past performance of the horse based on the strength of the field and some other things. Next, he would look at the current race and some of its situational factors. Finally, he would try to evaluate preferences which could influence performance. All of these factors can obviously be broken down into many different distinct variables. However, it does appear that Venter's initial winning model only had roughly 20 different variables in it. Through educated guessing plus trial and error, his model grew to over 100 different variables in the early 2000s. With a simple model like multivariate logistic regression, the various features were the main drivers of improved performance in this model. Venter took this very seriously. This is an example of one of the features that he engineered for the model. It's a variable called DP6A, and it tried to quantify distance preference of the horses. He did this by taking the existing model without the distance variable and having it create predictions. He would then take the actual finish position minus this new projected win position. This residual ended up giving some clue about the horse's preference for the race length. He likely tested hundreds of different features, maybe thousands of different features like this for the model. The first notable jump in the model came from adding in horse rest days. The second came in 1990 when the Hong Kong Jockey Club made their betting odds publicly available. He talks about how much value consumer sentiment actually has. And Venter made multiple models. Something really interesting to me is that he compared the performance of one model based purely on consumer opinion and one based on exclusively expert picks. He found that consumer opinion was actually much more predictive than the expert picks. And by combining consumer opinions with a baseline quantitative model, it could create a positive return while combining expert picks with a baseline model would not. So how did he use this model to bet? The way this model worked was Benter would compare the odds that his model produced with actual odds. When his model indicated a positive return, he would make the bet. He ended up betting on nearly every race over the course of five years, allowing him to leverage this law of large numbers that he cared so much about. So what did the return on the model look like? Here's a graph of the model's performance over the first five years. Mind you, these are the log returns, and they only did the log returns on this graph so that it would fit on the page. The actual graph would look something like this. Pretty crazy, right? I guess the law of large numbers worked out for him. It worked out so well that he was eventually banned from placing computer bets and he had to rely on betting slips at the racetracks. This brings us all the way back to the start of this video where he didn't cash his winning ticket. In horse racing, there are a number of exotic bets that allow you to create massive multiples on your wager. Venter's model was also able to create expected positive return in these scenarios. A simple exotic bet would be called a trifecta, where you correctly guess the order of the first three horses. Venter's exotic bet that hit was called a triple trio, where he correctly guessed trifectas in three different races. Needless to say, the odds of this are astronomically low. He ended up leaving this ticket that was worth over $10 million unclaimed, and all the proceeds went to charity. But why did he do that? It could have been to have a nice souvenir, but I think that there was a lot more of a calculated reason. Claiming the winnings could lead to more light on his operation. It could possibly prevent him from placing bets at that track anymore. Not cashing this check could increase his odds of continued future revenue far beyond that one payout. This math was probably pretty easy for him relative to all the math he did to build the models that he was using. There isn't an exact number, but people believe he made hundreds of millions of dollars, possibly up to a billion dollars in this horse betting business. So is a system like this replicable now? Almost 20 years have passed since Bill Benter made his fortune. It's funny because Benter actually does a feasibility study in some of his published research that I wanna add some things to. He measures this on a few different factors. The first is data availability, the second is beatability of the opposition, and the third is pool size limitations. Now let's look into that first factor, data availability. Now this data is more plentiful and accessible than ever. We likely have access to far more information than even Bill Benter did during his time. This is a competitive advantage for Benter who had full teams collecting and organizing this information. Now most people can have access to all of this data. With this factor alone, I think it could still be possible to replicate a system, but it would be a little bit difficult to differentiate. That brings us to our second point. The second thing that he evaluates is beatability of the opposition. With everyone having access to this data, perhaps there's less of an edge to be had by a single person doing it. Data was a very precious commodity. Early researches on horse racing involved data sets of only 200 races. Now 200,000 is a common size for a data set, so it's a, it's a whole new world. Still, I'd consider the general sports better relatively unsophisticated, so I think that considering this and the data availability, it probably would still be feasible to create a model like this. The third factor that he evaluates is the pool size limitations. This is related to the amount that the track takes and the bankroll that you have. This is probably the biggest limiting factor for the average better. The amount of money you'd need to start with to replicate a system like this would be absorbent. Benter himself says that this approach would be very difficult for an individual to replicate. In order to leverage the law of large numbers, you'd need some massive starting capital here. With this and the other two factors considered, this is really only possible if you were working in a group and it was very, very well backed. 
Bender doesn't consider some new factors that are available in 2022. The first is that models have come a long way. The logistic regression model that he was using has one small idiosyncrasy. When evaluating multiple variables, if too many of them are highly related, it can produce some very strange results. He had to spend a huge amount of time avoiding this problem that we call multicollinearity. New models and tools allow us to skirt this problem with relative ease. And people now have more powerful models that could create an even bigger edge than Bender had in his time. This is a positive sign for replication, but again, almost anyone has access to these powerful models and tools. The last factor that isn't considered carefully is the likelihood of being banned from a book. Bentor got very lucky that he wasn't completely barred from betting on horses in Hong Kong. In the age of online sports betting, if you're winning a lot, sports books can just simply stop you from using their services anymore. This used to not be the case with horse racing, where the book would actually take their cut before the payout was made. But in this day and age where consumer sentiment is a thing, you don't want to be known for having an operation where the individual random better can't go in and have a high chance of winning because there's some whales in the market that are using super advanced models and winning everything up. This ability to be banned is the single reason that I think a system like this would be almost impossible to implement now. If you found some way to get around this, then you just might be able to make a billion of your own. I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned something about a unique application of machine learning. I think it's really important to note that gambling can be addictive, and if you have a problem, you should reach out to the resources that I've linked below. I think gambling can be a fun way to validate your data science models, but you should only take part in it if you can afford to lose the money that you're putting up. Thank you so much for watching and good luck on your data science journey.